Hello everybody, my name is Henk de Burke. I'm a professor at the University of Sheffield and a director of the Prokhorov Center. I'm here in the University of Sheffield's Jessa building to interview the American novelist and visual artist Audrey Niffenegger. Audrey, welcome to Sheffield and to the Prokhorov Center. Thank you so much, Henk. You're best known as the author of The Time Traveller's Wife, but you're also a visual artist and for a very long time, until recently, you were also an academic, a university professor. I want to talk about all three dimensions of your work uh, and then in the second part of this interview uh, look in detail at The Time Traveller's Wife. Okay. But let's start at the beginning of your career. Uh, in this book here, uh, Awake in the Dream World, you write that from a very early age you wanted to be an artist. That seems a strange thing for a kid uh, to say or to think most children want to be um, I don't know, doctors or lawyers or pilots or sports people, but you wanted to be an artist. What did you think that being an artist meant and why did you want to be one? My mother is an artist, uh, she's a textile artist, mm -hmm. and so from the time I was a child I was watching her make quilts and work on all sorts of art projects, and uh, so I knew from the time I was little that you could still make things when you were grown up. It didn't have to be something that only children did. And um, she would take us to the Art Institute of Chicago, and I had art lessons outside of school, and uh, she, she made sure that I, she could see that I liked it, and that I did it for pleasure and not just out of some sense of obligation. And so mm -hmm. she made sure that I got to see lots and lots of art and just had the opportunities. I, I suppose when you were younger it was just fun doing it and then, then later was there sort of a driving force behind it that you wanted to express yourself or that you wanted to um, gain clarity about sort of inchoate feelings within you and you thought okay if, if I express these if I internalize them then I get more clarity about myself or is it a way for you to deal with worries and fears and, and anxieties? All of the above, but also there's something very necessary and satisfying about externalizing something and also the, just the pleasures of materials. I think in the current culture where things are becoming less and less tactile. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have all these little phone devices that we stroke all the time, but people seem to not do so many things with their hands. I, I was reading recently that uh, here in Britain, um, someone, I believe it was in the NHS, was saying that they're having a real problem now with students coming to medical school and wanting to be surgeons, but they don't have the fine motor skills that people used to just seemingly automatically have. And I think perhaps it's that maybe we don't sew as much, we're not drawing as much, we don't write by hand so much. And so it seems as though people are not connecting up their hands to their brains and their eyes in the way that we just thought was automatic. We, yeah. we seem to be missing a step. It is a very, very different experience, is not? I mean, if you think of poetry, for example, I can't think of reading poetry on a mobile phone, for example. You want to read it in a book. I mean, I, I want to read it in a book. But also, the, even the smell of a book. If you've got, I really love secondhand books. Mm. And they've got a sort of strange smell about them, which is, it just gives you, it, it's a much more, um, I'm tempted to say, sort of holistic experience when you have the book and you have the way it smells and you have the cover and all the rest of it. That's different from just having the text on, on one's mobile phone, is it not? Yeah, I mean, the book is a technology that's evolved over thousands of years in sync with the human body. And, I mean, the parts of the book are named as though they are small mammals. I mean, they have spines, they have heads and feet, and we, we somehow seem to see them as an extension of ourselves, and the way that you hold a book is very intimate mm, mm. and so far our devices are not geared to our bodies 
as well. I'm sure they will be. But you see everybody doing this, and we're all giving ourselves strange posture because these devices are pulling us into a hunch. And um, You sometimes see our students walking down the stairs or up the stairs with their mobile phones, which I think is quite dangerous anyway. But it's sort of, walk, as you say, they're walking like this. Yeah. And it's, 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 very, it's very strange. At the same time, of course, or also, when you're using a mobile phone, you're constantly getting all sorts of messages. So just imagine reading a novel uh, or, uh, or a poem on your mobile, and then you get a text message, and then you want to re respond to the text message, so then the reading of the novel is interrupted. It is all very, very different. Where does the visual aspect come in for you? Do you, do you have stories in your head that you then want to visualize, as it were? Or do the pictures come first and you think, you know, I want to tell these pictures, but in order to tell them, I've got to sort of narrativize them, uh, turn them into stories? For me, it goes back and forth. And sometimes I have ideas that are images, and sometimes I have ideas that are words or phrases. And that's one of the most interesting parts at the very beginning, trying to figure out what is the form best suited to the idea. Like, The Time Traveler's Wife, when I originally thought about it, the idea first came as this phrase, The Time Traveler's Wife, which I wrote down. And I started thinking about it, and I thought, OK, so already we have two characters. One's a time traveler. The other must obviously spend a lot of her time wondering where he is. And I started to think more and more about these people, and I thought, OK, well, I'll just do one of these graphic novels like I do. That's mm -hmm. what I do. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, OK, this is going to be difficult, because to show someone jumping around in time, still images have trouble portraying the passage of time. And people have come up with various strategies. I mean, if you look at medieval painting, sometimes they'll show the same figure a number of times in one picture in order to show that, you know, so-and-so has walked down the road and, oh, look, now he's at, uh, you know, the, the stable in Bethlehem or whatever it is. Mm. And it's, it's clunky. Like, it, it suited them just fine because they didn't have movies. But there's... When, when you need time to work a certain way, I, I came to the conclusion that I had the choice of either writing a novel or making a film. And at the time I was super, super broke. And there was no way that a film was going to happen. Plus I'm not the world's most collaborative person. I always marvel at these big budget movies with their credits at the end that have like 300 people or God knows how many people it takes to make one of those Harry mm. Potter films. And I just think the, the teamwork that is needed to make that happen astounds me. And I am not one of those people. <laughs> so I sat down and wrote a novel instead. Is, is that a real challenge then? Because uh, you had first the, the title, you said The Time Traveler's Wife, but then I imagine you must have also had some pictures in your mind. So you're trying to narrativize, tell a story about or with these pictures. But then it's maybe a bit like when you've had a dream and you're trying to tell the dream to someone else and you're telling the dream and you realize, no, that's not what the dream was like. And is, is that the real challenge, how to put into words stuff that maybe as images is very clear in your own mind? That's always an interesting problem. And if you feel that you want very much to be certain that the reader or viewer will know exactly how the thing looked, you can always do comics or any of the forms that bring the imagery and the, and the words together. I've been thinking a lot lately about opera, mm -hmm. which I just love. I'm not knowledgeable, but I go to a lot of opera, and I just think that's such a great form because uh, you, can, you can just do so much with it, and it's so strange. But comics I like because you, you have the images, you have the words, and then you are very specific 
and so whoever is looking at it can see exactly what that character looks like or what that street is supposed to be about. But the thing about writing the usual sort of novel without any pictures is that you can either double down on descriptions and try really hard to let the reader form the same picture in their mind that you have in your mind. Or you can kind of embrace the vagueness and kind of let them move things in from their own experience. Mm -hmm. um, in comics, there's an interesting idea, a theory, where the more specific and realistic the drawing, the less the viewer identifies with that character. So if you, if you make a drawing that looks uh, very much like a real human, and someone comes along and looks at it, they'll, they'll see who it is and see it as that person, but that person will be very other. Whereas if you do something like Peanuts, where it's basically squiggly lines and hardly, I mean, you can definitely pick out Charlie Brown and he doesn't look the same as Lucy and you can, you definitely recognize who each one is, but also they're, they're almost like smiley faces with squiggles. Mm. And there's something about that that really lets people move themselves into the character and identify very strongly. So when you have no pictures at all, I think that people furnish your world they with their own supply their own pictures, stuff. as it were. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's and really interesting, yeah. Yeah, so for example, if you're reading my book and you've never been to Chicago, you don't necessarily know what the Aragon Ballroom looks like, why would you? So you just take the equivalent thing from your own youth and plug it in there because why not? Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of, the, one of the challenges people have when they adapt literature to TV or, or film is that every single reader made their own movie in their head mm -hmm. and the real movie is never going to match. Yeah. That, that's really interesting because I was going to ask you, uh, because you're both a novelist now and, and a visual artist and together with your husband, Addy Campbell, you've done uh, this book, uh, Bizarre Romance, where you do the stories and Addy Campbell has done the, the, the pictures. Addy Campbell, of course, is a famous visual artist in his own right who did the uh, illustration for Alan Moore's uh, From Hell. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, would it not be your dream or is it not your dream to actually do comics where you do both the stories, uh, the text and the pictures? But from what you're saying now, it, it's, it sounds like actually doing a novel, in a sense, paradoxically, gives you more space kind of to express things because you can be more ambiguous about things. I have done... Uh one comic, it's called The Night Bookmobile. Um, I did it for The Guardian a while back and it's, mm -hmm. they put it out as a book eventually. And it was very interesting to put into practice all these uh, ideas um, that I knew about from looking at other people's comics and reading about how comics work. And so it was, it was a challenge to, to do that and it's it's only, uh, what was it, 32 weeks, I think it was, so one, one page a week. And uh, it, it gave me a lot of respect for people who do this their whole lives, daily or weekly, and it's... Because it's in comics, uh, or even in cartoons, you still got to create some sort of openness towards the reader and, yeah. and on the one hand try to express what you want to express and in that sense be specific but on the other hand as you were saying also not be specific so that the you know readers can bring their own hopes, fears, worries, the imagination to what is, what is on the page. That, that must be very, yeah. very hard to do, yeah. And, and it's interesting to see the evolution of comics artists because if you think of say Doonesbury, I don't know if you Mm -hmm. Ever read Dean's yeah. But when you go and look at the very earliest strips, he was in college and they're very squiggly and he can't draw. And the writing is sharp and instantly recognizable, but the characters look like something you drew while you were talking on the phone. And then just through practice, he sort of pulls it together and uh, we get the Doonesbury we know and love. But yeah. 
it's, it's interesting to see how the discipline of doing it really sharpens up people's end results. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what I like is to go back and forth and to have the availability of lots of different ways to tell stories. Um, I collaborated a few years ago with Wayne McGregor on a ballet. Mm -hmm. Um, so he that's asked a, me that's to a Raven Girl. Raven Girl, yeah. He asked me to do a dark fairy tale, which was just the most fun thing ever. And so I, I came up with this thing, and I kept saying, "Well, so Wayne, uh, if I do this, I mean, are you going to be able to dance that? I mean, and he'd go, "Don't worry about it. Just tell a story and let me worry about the dance." Mm -hmm. And the end result, I just it blew me away. It was so wonderful and a great experience, and the dancers were just so clever and beautiful, it really mm -hmm. was good. But the idea that I'm going to write something in words and then this story is going to be told with no words at all, the, the translation just was a very interesting mm. process to yeah, watch. Yeah, yeah. What about the other dimension of your work? Because until very recently, I think until 2015, you were also an academic university professor. Uh, was that sometimes a, a help or uh, on the contrary, a hindrance with your own work, because then you develop this more analytical, critical perspective. And I can imagine that, you know, you then, you, you're teaching your students to be critical vis-a-vis -vis their own work, vis-a-vis -vis the work of other writers, but then of course in a sense that could turn against yourself, that you're becoming overly critical uh, towards your own work, so that you're no longer able to be creative because there's constantly this academic voice saying, oh, this isn't good enough or, you know, this doesn't really work. Is it paralyzing or is it enriching? I found it enriching, but I'm not the most academic of academics. academics. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually was always like, you know, theory. Like, I, I always saw th a lot of theory is very inhibiting, as you say. Mm -hmm. and. It makes perfect sense to me for people to come along later and analyze and do close readings and develop theories and argue about theories. But for the practicing artist, as you say, these can really be an impediment rather than a help. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's really valuable to be able to understand other people's work through the lens of critical theory. Yeah. But wow, is it a problem when you're a graduate student and yeah. you're just trying to make a painting? <laughs> can, can that stuff, can painting, can writing, any sort of creative work, can it be taught at, at, at all? Yes. Tell, tell me a little bit more about that, because I think you can maybe help people to, you know, from my own background in sort of philosophy and cultural theory, um, you can help uh, people to, to look at things critically help people to be creative, I find that next door to impossible. But you're saying that you, you can encourage that? Yeah, I mean, what I was talking about last night... Um, last night when you gave the program Last night lecture, when I was going yes. to talk, yeah. I wanted to talk about work habits because I knew that I would be talking to a lot of students. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like, okay, mm -hmm. probably the audience will not be all students, but many students. And I think it's important for students to realize that, first of all, that even people who have done it for a while get into blocks and problems and, and have to rethink their own practice. Uh, but also that the being a creative person is not all about starving in garrets or waiting for inspiration, you know, it just, it's not like you're going to like be touched by the gods. It, it really is about developing receptive habits of being, you know, just sort mm -hmm. of going about your life in ways that encourage not only having ideas, but developing ideas and being able to sustain your own art practice. And I know a lot of people who are practicing artists and have managed to do it for decades and 
like I was talking about, the, the main impediment really has to do with finance and the fact that the culture doesn't make it easy to practice these things and, and get paid. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about that and, and, and ask you the question. I mean, you were great yesterday when you gave the lecture and you can see that you really enjoy working with students. Yeah. But I was wondering whether being an academic and a teacher was also an economic necessity. Because for, for a long time you were really struggling, were you not? I think you write somewhere yeah. and you said, uh, you know, I would get uh, day after day, I would get rejection after rejection, including re rejections along the lines of, this is brilliant we're not going to publish it, yes. basically because it's not <laughs> financially viable. So was being a teacher for you probably was also a way to keep yourself in bread and butter whilst then also being able to pursue your art. Yeah, I, I got into teaching almost by accident. Um, I started teaching when I was 23. Mm -hmm. um, I had graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and my main uh, activity was printmaking and for printmaking especially etching you need a lot of equipment and I expensive mean, I, equipment very expensive equipment and so I had returned to the studio that I had been working in before I went to college and it was just a little community art center but I happened to grow up in Evanston Illinois which is a suburb of Chicago and it's the home of Northwestern University mm -hmm. yes. it's got a vibrant art scene and so this this little art center was actually quite wonderful and had all this nice equipment and the printmaking department had a lot of artists who were fantastic. I mean, just wonderful people with amazing skills. And uh, so I went back there and was uh, a student in the class again. And then the teacher who I'd known for, I don't know, six or seven years, I mean, I started making prints when I was 15. Uh, she said, you know, I, I think I'm not going to teach anymore, and do you want to teach? And I'm like, well, whoa, I've never taught, and these people are all twice my age, and, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to buy listen, that. Listen to you. Yeah, and she's like, no, no, really, you could do it. I mean, you know, it, it was, because it was community education, I didn't mm -hmm. need a graduate degree to teach, mm -hmm. and... So she just kind of threw me in at the deep end of the pool. And I remember the first few times that I had to, my class was only eight people. <laughs> and they were people I already knew. Mm -hmm. But I really felt that I was impersonating a teacher for a long time. And yeah. so then I went back to graduate school because I thought, well, I actually enjoy teaching. I think I'm kind of good at it, but I don't have the right qualification to go. Sure teach at a college and so I went to Northwestern and got an MFA and um, and then embarked on being an adjunct for 12 years and uh, being an adjunct back then was not a picnic but it is it was nothing like as difficult and horrible as it is now because over the course of my teaching career universities and colleges have become so deranged in the way they treat their adjuncts and just somewhere along the line. Because lines, they give them too much teaching or because you've got to do too, too much? They don't pay them uh, enough. Okay. And they don't have any job security. I mean, I don't really know what's going on over here, but in America, there are people living in their cars. I mean, it's just bonkers. The pay hasn't really gone up since mm. I was an adjunct. So it's incredibly exploitive. And even back then, I was, I was just boiling with rage half the time. <laughs> Not at my students, because my students were fabulous. But the, this idea that universities are going to be run by people with business degrees, like they were corporations, and we're going to make money. Yeah. Now we have that, but the pressure then is in, in, in the UK is largely you've got to do more and more administration. Uh, and, and most of it doesn't seem to be terribly useful sort of administration for the sake of ab ab Busy work, administration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that the reason you gave it up, that you said, uh, you know, I've got enough money now, I, I don't need this? Well, with a bunch of other artists, I had founded a book and paper center, and we had developed an MFA program in book arts, and then... Um, I, I had moved into teaching creative writing as well, so I was actually really happy with 
the students and the classes and how everything was going in the classroom. And by the time I stopped teaching, I was a full, pro pro full professor and I was tenured. So I didn't have any complaints on mm -hmm. my own behalf. But the problem was that I was traveling so much. And so between book tour and teaching and trying to get my own work done, there were just not enough hours in the day. And um, the last few years that I was teaching, uh, my class was a seminar for people who were writing their first novels. And I would not accept more than 10 people mm -hmm. into the seminar. Sure. But my deal with the students was that I would read everything they gave me. And I mean, some people gave me 40 pages, some people gave me 600. And the reason I wanted to run it that way was that I had been frustrated when I was writing my first novel because <clears throat> nobody, like at one point I signed up for a course and they wouldn't take more than 15 pages. And I'm like, how are you going to teach somebody to write a novel if you're only going to read 15 pages? That's just for the convenience of the teacher. Mm. So I was like, okay, everybody just bring it on. And so I would get this tidal wave of pages every semester and I thought, I'm never going to get my book done. That's one of the reasons my own work went so slowly for a long time. I, I just finally had to accept reality that I couldn't do all these things mm -hmm. at once. Yeah. So, so somewhere in the early 2000s, I, I guess everything changed because then you published The Time Traveler's Wife, which became an international bestseller. I read somewhere that you got an advance of $5 million for your second novel, Her Fearful Symmetry. Uh, is, is that then a good thing in the sense that you say to yourself, okay, now I can relax a bit because I've got financial security? Or is it actually paralyzing because then the expectations are so high, you say to yourself, I've got all this money, this got to be really good. And of course, now there's a big readership, a big audience out there. Um, and they are saying, you know, uh, this must be at least as good as the time traveler's wife. So is that success? Is that sometimes, is it a good or a bad thing? Um, having a big pile of money thrown at you is a good thing uh, because then you can pay off your credit cards and, uh, you know, buy a house and all that. Um, I am in favor But what about, the does that not put this enormous pressure on you as well? The first book, no one cares, no one's watching. Mm -hmm. You take as long as you like, you do what you want. If people don't like it, oh well, and you... What the hell? Yeah, it's, it's not uh, anybody's problem but your own. Um, with the second book, I did not put it under contract, and so the whole time I was writing it, I had no deadline, mm -hmm. did what I pleased. If people didn't like it, too bad. So when the American publisher was bidding on it, which is what you're talking about, um, they had the whole thing. They, they could, they could yeah. see what they were buying. There was no question of fulfilling their expectation or not. And, um, and it, was, it was a bit of a drag that that became public. The reason it became public was that there was an auction for the mm -hmm. rights. And somebody spoke to the New York Times about it. Isn't that weird? <laughs> that anyone would care. So I think the reason it was news was because that happened, um, th there was a kind of big freak out in publishing around the time of the recession. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was news because everybody was like, woohoo, somebody got paid. Maybe there's hope for everybody yet. And you know, of course, these things are cyclical and yeah. you know, also, it's slightly misleading, of course, because then the focus is, in all the, is on all the money and not on the year, years of very hard work before that. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that produces a good result is feeling free to pursue whatever crazy thing you need to pursue. And the second novel, it's a ghost story. It's set in Highgate Cemetery. I had a fabulous time infiltrating Highgate Cemetery and became good friends with a lot of people there and the novel changed quite a lot because mm -hmm. of my experiences there. So I felt like I got to write the book I wanted and 
this filter of money didn't help anything, but it didn't change the book. Mm -hmm. And so then I went on tour for what seemed like forever and had a nice time going out and talking to readers. And the, the second book is so different from the first book. And people who read the second book without having read the first book, they're like, oh, I liked Symmetry best. And the people who read the first book first are like, oh, I like Time Travelers best. And so they, it's not as though you couldn't like them both, but it wasn't as though I delivered exactly the same dopamine hit both times. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. I'll, I'll ask you, uh, uh, you about that in the second part of yeah. the uh, interview. In the second part of the interview, I want to look in, uh, in more detail at uh, the time travellers. Uh, yeah, wife. but what you're asking about, I guess, is does money change one's studio life? Um, the it isn't really the money, it is the scrutiny. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's really about expectations. I mean, on the part of the publishers, the readers, the people who now know you. Yeah, more the more the readers. the The publishers are people I know. We can have a conversation, and they can tell me exactly what they think about stuff. And so, with that, it's more. Everything is more understood and more on the table, mm -hmm. whereas if you are trying to satisfy some imaginary reader, I think that that doesn't have a good effect on the work. Because if you, if you start thinking, oh, the reader won't get this, or I can't do that, well... It becomes a straitjacket. Yeah, I mean, you've, you sort of have to imagine that your reader is the most clever, wonderful person and you, you kind of have to write up for that person yeah. and, and really just assume that they can go with you and that you're not going to have to, you know, kind of cram it into them. Mm -hmm. Is there no pressure from the publishers as well, though? Because you give the publishers your manuscript uh, and then they read it and don't they then say, oh, we don't really like this or this isn't going to work. Can you please change this? And then. I would imagine that sometimes you'd say, well, sometimes it's probably good, and other times you think, no way, I'm not changing distance, but yeah, but you must, and so on. Is that sometimes a struggle? Um, I'm very lucky in my editors. Mm -hmm. um, my, my English editor is Dan Franklin, who's just fantastic, and um, my American editor is Nan Graham, who, these people are very, senior and very experienced and very calm and they're not um, not dogmatic about things maybe because that's yeah. the worst if they if they feel that they're writers themselves and instead of wanting to help you they wanted to write they want to write they start wanting to write a novel that they want to write rather than the novel that you want to write I think that people who practice editing like that probably don't last very long as editors because when you start, um, if, if you have too much of your mind on will it sell, then you end up sort of smoothing everything out. I think that MFA programs can also be guilty of this, mm -hmm. you know, a kind mm -hmm. of group think. Yeah, yeah. And the thing that seems to lead to successful published books is being open to the next strange thing. There's always this thing going on, I don't know if it's really, it's in, it's in publishing but also in book selling, where people say, oh, you know, we want the next Da Vinci Code, we want the next Lovely Bones, oh, we want the next Time Traveler's Wife, and you can't do that because if somebody tried to imitate one of these things, it would just be a watered down thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's all this. The good thing about these books is, and also, of course, precisely, say, the time traveler's wife. One of the good things about it is that it's original, and the moment you try and repeat it, it is no longer another time traveler's wife because right. it's no longer origin original. Yeah, I mean, I'm writing a sequel to it, and I'm not even trying to repeat it. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to follow the new thing where it goes, and. Um, 
Okay. We'll then look at some of these uh, things in, in the second <laughs> part of our inter interview. Yeah, I feel okay. like I feel like I keep you know trying to take it over to where you. Anyway. That that's fine. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, to <laughs> okay. the second part in uh, in a moment. Thank you. Sure.